Thank you, Mike. Can everybody hear me? That was the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. As I referred to last week in our prayers, I had an oral argument at the Court of Appeals uh, relating to a DUI case with a woman named Jermasha Nelson. And after my argument was finished, one of my coworkers said to me, you must be the king of felony DUIs. And for those of y'all that don't know, I'm uh, not familiar with the legal world, not lawyers. A felony DUI in South Carolina is a DUI driving under the influence where somebody gets seriously hurt. Either they get a serious bodily injury or death happens. Somebody dies as a result of it. Now, it's a little bit of a misnomer to say that a felony DUI is serious because every DUI is serious. Because every time someone drives behind the wheel of a car drunk, the worst possible thing could happen. You could die, somebody else could die, or somebody could get seriously hurt or injured from that. And I, when I heard my coworker say that, I said, you know, I, I do have a lot of DUIs that I prosecute, prosecuted when I was a prosecutor and am handling on appeal now that I work in uh, appellate law. But it got me to thinking about my past. Now, in the Methodist Church, we don't do confession. You know, in the Catholic Church, our Catholic brothers and sisters go and confess their sins to a priest. And then you know, the priest says, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. We do that a little bit when we have our communion. Uh, we say, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Um, we don't do that in Methodist Church, but I am going to confess something to you right now. Your dear pastor used to drink and drive. Not a lot, but one time is too many. Now, I had two particular occasions that were, should have been my coming to Jesus moments. I refer to them as my coming to Jesus moments, but they didn't immediately stop me like they should have. One time it happened when I was in college. I was with my sister in Chapel Hill. And the truth is, I hadn't been drinking that much. I drank a few beers with her, and then I took her to a uh, location she was trying to go to, dropped her off. And on the way back, I got into a car wreck. I was in a left turn only lane, and I was trying to merge. I said, I can't turn left here. And I sideswiped somebody. Um, and, you know, when I was trying to merge back in the right lane, he was in my, in my blind spot. Now, everything turned out okay from that. Uh, more damage to my car than the other person. The person that was driving was fine. The police that responded to the wreck, they didn't even ask me if I had been drinking. Probably because it was during the middle of the day, and honestly, I really hadn't had that much to drink. But it should have been a wake-up call for me. The second time, I really did have too much to drink. This was when I was in law school. Now, I should have known better because I was older. I was studying to become a lawyer. But I woke up the next morning after a night of drinking, and I didn't remember driving home. And that scared the life out of me. Now, my car was parked perfectly straight in the driveway. No harm, no foul, right? But there could have been. There could have been the absolute worst harm. Now, this week I went with my friend Emory Smith to Trinity Episcopalian Cathedral for a Lenten service, uh, lunch, lunchtime service series. And the pastor that was preaching there, he preached on Psalm 6, which we read in our call to worship. And he told the tragic story of his cousin who had a child who died at the age of six in a car accident. That same cousin went on to have another child. Their second child died at the age of six in a car accident. Now, he examined the question we've addressed here before, uh, commonly discussed in relation to the book of Job. Why do bad things happen to good people? What did they do to deserve this terrible fate that happened to him? And, of course, he concluded, as I think the 
book of Job tells us that you don't have to do something for something bad to happen to you. That's not what God is doing. God doesn't punish us for the things that we've done. It's not because you do good things, good things happen to you. And because you do bad things, bad things happen to you. It's not always that simple. Sometimes God has a larger plan that we don't know about and can't see. But, and I actually told Emery this story, the same story as I told you all about my prior history uh, drinking. And that got me to wondering the inverse of that question. Why do good things happen to bad people? Or, to put it another way, why has God shown such immense grace on a sinner like me? Now, I picked our scriptures today. Uh, first, the scripture from Acts, because one of you reached out to me this week in an email and genuinely said, I need some scriptural guidance to know how a Christian should react to somebody like Vladimir Putin. Person that wrote to me, I won't betray their confidence, but they said, I'm genuinely having trouble praying for my enemy and, and loving my enemy when such terrible things are happening in the world. Now, the first thing that came to mind was this scripture from Acts. I told this person, I said, consider the example of Saul. Saul was a objectively not a nice person. Is our scripture in Acts chapter 9 and previously in Acts chapter 8 tells us Paul, sorry, excuse me, Saul was actively persecuting and hunting down Christians. Not just he happened to run in Christians and maybe killed a few along the way. He actively sought them out for persecution. In fact, chapter 8 and the end of chapter 7 tells us that Saul was responsible for stoning Stephen. Stephen is, of course, a character in the book of Acts. Um, and Paul explicitly approved a crowd to stone him to death. So, excuse me, Saul. Um, he changes his name to Paul, as we find out later on in the book of Acts. But I use this as an example to show that if God can touch the heart of Saul... And use somebody like Saul for his purposes, then he can use anyone, and he can touch anyone's heart. Saul, of course, as I already referenced, became Paul that we know of that wrote books like Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and really about half of the New Testament. So half of this New Testament, this Bible that we rely on every week, uh, at least as, as I said, half of the New Testament comes from a person who made it his mission to actively oppose the gospel of Jesus Christ and to hunt down and kill Christians. So if God can use Saul for good, he can use anybody for good. Now the converse of that is also true. Just as God chose to touch Saul's heart and to change him and, and make him into a disciple of Jesus Christ, God can also choose to harden someone's heart. We see this in the book of Exodus. Where God, we are told repeatedly, God chose to harden Pharaoh's heart. Now that was ultimately for a purpose, because it allowed God to show various times his, the plagues of Egypt and, of course, the miracle of the parting of the Red Sea, and show his favor upon the Israelites as they departed Egypt. So ultimately, there was a purpose in God doing this. Now, I don't know what God is doing right now. As far as touching the hearts of the leaders of Europe and the United States. And it's probably about as worthwhile or successful to predict what will happen in Europe and what will happen with the various leaders in this conflict. As it would be to try to predict what's going to happen in this basketball tournament that's going to start this next weekend that we call March Madness. Nobody can predict that. We can't predict what God will do and what God's ultimate plan for geopolitical politics is. All we can do is pray that God would touch their hearts. But what we can focus on is ourselves, which leads me to the next scripture. I've always liked this scripture in 1 Corinthians 4 through 7 because of the imagery that's used of us being like jars of clay. Now, there's a saying that goes, there but for the grace of God go I. And as I 
explained with my two uh, stories from my, my ne'er-do-well past, somehow, by the grace of God, I not only made it through these two incidents of driving while drinking, but God had mercy on me and everybody else that was on the road with me that night. Now, I don't know why God spared me in those nights so long ago. Maybe it was like Paul. Paul was a persecutor of Christians to then become an advocate for Christians. Maybe God intended something for me similarly. I used to drive, drink and drive, and then I became a prosecutor of people who drink and drive. Based on my record of success at trial and on appeal, I don't know if that was the purpose. That's a joke, y'all can laugh. That's self-demeaning that I haven't had a lot of success. Maybe it's so one day I would realize the error of my ways and become a minister and be your pastor. Whatever the reason, I believe that God is still molding me as somebody would a jar of clay or a piece of clay. And I'm still learning from my sins to be better. I told you I like this image of the jar of clay because it says that we, are tre- we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that all, this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And I think about a jar of clay. You might not know what's inside of it. When we see somebody out in public and per- you know, on the street, we don't know what kind of treasure is in their heart. Now, it's our hope that the light of Christ would shine out from us and people would be able to see that treasure from within us. Another feature of a jar of clay is it can break pretty easily. We're pretty fragile people. But with God's help and with God constantly shaping us and molding us, we have managed to stay intact. The scripture goes on to tell us we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. So if we're thinking of this image of God constantly shaping us and molding us as a potter shapes a a, a pot of clay, we're not only being shaped by God, but we're being shaped and molded by the external forces of this world, the difficulties we encounter, the temptations we encounter in our daily lives are shaping and molding us. Now, I believe just like clay is not... Finished. It's not set until you put it into the kiln. I remember when I was a kid in school, we made clay pots and was always really excited to see them go in the fire and the kiln, they would burn. And then, they, then they're really set in stone. Can't change them at that point. You could break it, but you can't melt it down and then remold it. Now I believe we too can be molded and stay malleable right up until the moment we take our last breath. We've talked about this before in the uh, example of the workers and the the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Even the worker that comes to work in the vineyard at the very last moment, he gets the same reward as the worker that started out at the beginning of the day. We can be molded up until the point we draw our very last breath. And maybe that's what God has intended to do with my life. Certainly, The way I started out, despite being a preacher's kid, I wasn't always on the best path. But I would like to think this is the path, being in this pulpit, being your pastor, is the path that God ultimately chose me to be on. And maybe I wouldn't have been here if it hadn't been for these missteps before. When I was younger, my brother and I went to the North Carolina Zoo. And as we were leaving an exhibit, my brother was explaining to me the theory of evolution and we had just been to the I guess the monkey or the gorilla exhibit and he was saying you see we come from monkeys you can see how similar uh, apes are to humans and uh, there's room for debate on that I know I know I've talked to you all about how evolution and Christianity can coexist but I'm not going to go down the road and make an argument for that today but there was an old lady sitting on a bench out there And she didn't take too kindly to what my brother had to say. And she said, boy, you ain't come from no monkey. God made you. I told that to be kind of amusing. I got a laugh out of y'all. 
But she was partially correct. We were made by God. We did come from God. God did made us. We weren't made by solely by external forces or natural evolutionary forces. We didn't come from a monkey. We were made by God. But what she didn't get right is that God hasn't finished his creation yet. We're still being molded by God up until this moment, and we will be molded by him and by the external difficulties and forces we face in this world as we leave this place and go forward. So it's my prayer today that everybody realizes God isn't finished with you yet. There is still a shape, maybe, that he's trying to mold you into to be the creation he had in mind. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah, God tells Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you. God knows what we ultimately will become, what he has in mind for us. We may not know that yet, but know this. Know that we can still change. Know that God still has a plan for us. Some of y'all might be later on in life to say, I've, I've been through all this before. I don't, know, I don't know if God has any plans for me left. I don't know what I'm still supposed to do. There's still a plan God has for you. Still a shape he wants to mold you into. We don't know what that is yet, but God has a plan for us. And despite the missteps you may have taken in your past, that's part of God's plan, part of his molding that's led you to this moment. And it's part of what will ultimately we lead you where God wants you, to know, wants you to go. So as we go forth from here, let's be open and be discerning of that molding that's taking place. We may not be a bad person like Saul was, we may not have done something bad like I did, but we haven't lived perfect lives. But where God wants us to go, what, what he's shaping us for is the perfect outcome for our piece of clay. When we're finally finished and put into the kiln, we'll be with God in his heavenly kingdom. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.